Okay. Well, welcome to the next session, everyone. I'm Scott Westpatrick. I'm the DHS2 Analytics Product Manager, and I am really excited to be able to provide, um, to host a session on data quality and exactly what we're doing with DHS2 uh, for data quality. We're going to have three really interesting case studies come up as well as some um, nice kind of tricks and tips um, presented in the beginning. But I'm just going to say a few quick words about the, the program and, and introductions here. So first of all, I'm giving the introduction, just a few more things to say on that. And then we are going to have Bob Pond, who can't join us virtually. Um, it's, he's on the West Coast of the US, so it's a little bit early for him right now. But he has proved, made a video for us. Bob is really kind of one of the, the global experts on data quality, working with us and the WHO. Um, and he's prepared a quick presentation on how to use DHIS2 standard dashboards for data quality. And then we, get, we have three really interesting case studies coming. So first, Angela Abba from Nigeria on exactly what Nigeria has been doing for data quality checks. Then we have Tina Kumunja. Kum, sorry, I, I just destroyed your surname. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Kun, Jim. Yeah. Um, I apologize for that. Uh, and uh, Tina's going to be taking us through exactly how what the WHO has been doing for uh, workforce monitoring and accountability and data quality checks that they've instituted there for that. And then uh, finally, Joseph Fanner is going to take us through exactly what Madagascar has been doing for their data quality checks. Um, if you, again, just as a reminder, if you have any questions at any point throughout the presentation, hopefully we might have a few minutes at the end for to answer those. But um, more than likely, uh, we won't. And please, so please post your questions to the community practice, and I'll be having a look at that while the others are presenting, and hopefully we can get back with your with with answers um, as soon as possible. One quick point um, to add to the introduction is what we are doing in collaboration with WHO. Really, we have been kind of moving step by step with the WHO as they've been updating and improving their data quality approaches. We've been trying to backfill the same approach um, to, into the technology so that DHIS2 both supports the WHO approaches as well as we have the training materials, the guidance documentation. Uh, to support the use of DHIS2 in the WHO data various WHO data quality approaches. And, and actually, Andrew, in the last presentation, made references to this, was, uh, which they're doing in Rwanda, which is really cool. You know, essentially, the WHO has uh, two standard approaches. They have the WHO annual data quality review, um, and we have developed, uh, in partnership with them, the WHO data quality application that is there to help countries through this uh, review process. It actually will produce an annual data quality report um, automatically for the countries uh, based upon the standard WHO format. We've also been working with them to support more routine lower level district data quality reviews. Uh, again, Andrew actually made reference to this and had a wonderful picture um, of what they do that on a monthly basis in Rwanda, the data uh, verification validation exercises they do. But we're also trying to build out tools, functionalities in DHIS2 to help the user um, perform these data quality reviews. Um, and uh, I'm going to highlight some of those and Bob in the next presentation is going to highlight those as well. Um, and finally, all of this is coming together in our data quality tools and training documentation and guidance. Um, a couple of quick links for you here, the data quality guide, um, which we produce a, uh, a data quality guide for how to use DHIS2 for data quality. Um, various tools, tricks, uh, tips, tricks, applications, everything that you need to know about how to really get DHIS2 helping you out with data quality is in the first link there, uh, dhis2.org backslash WHO hyphen data quality or DQ. And then the second link there is to the WHO website where they have all of their various data quality tools and, and guidance documentation. Um, really a treasure trove of information there. Um, a lot of really great uh, um, support documentation. Please have a look at these two. Again, they sh we're, we're trying to make sure they line up and, and kind of um, sing the same song, so to speak, um, but a lot of useful information. And then we are trying to summarize and produce all of this information into a data quality academy. Um, we actually have the Next Data Quality Academy. It's a level two academy, meaning you need to be a bit proficient with DHIS2. Uh, we will get fairly technical in how to configure DHIS2 for data quality checks and how to really utilize some of the, the more advanced data quality functionalities. 
but that academy is coming up October 19th through 30th. The registration is open on our website, dhis2.org backslash academy. If you're interested in that, please go ahead, um, head over to the academy, register. We're very interested in having country teams attend that academy. Um, we're specifically de devoting some time to work one-on-one -on -one with countries to implement some of the tools and um, guidance uh, directly into their HMIS if they're interested. Um, but really this academy is kind of the, the go-to place to, to get all of this information condensed down into a, um, something that's a, a bit more actionable. So with that, I am going to switch over to a, another presentation. So bear with me as I change the screens. And because Bob can't join us, because um, we're he's hopefully still in bed, uh, he's produced a video for us, like I said. So I'm going to play the video, and Bob's going to take us through how to um, utilize DHIS2 standard dashboards for data quality checks. Good afternoon. My name is Bob Pond. I'm a consultant working for the University of Oslo and the World Health Organization. In my brief presentation on standard data quality dashboards, I'm going to share with you a couple of tips on how to use the standard DHIS2 applications, which you are all familiar with, the Data Visualizer app and the Pivot Table app, how to use these apps to visualize suspicious values and place them as alerts on a dashboard. The first tip involves using charts to show month-to-month -month trends and to review these charts, particularly at a decentralized level. And the second tip is to make use of pivot tables that present a summary of all the extreme outlier values of a collection of key indicators. These are extreme outlier values which have been identified with DHIS2 predictor rules. So let me go ahead and get started. Many of you are probably familiar with how the values of immunization indicators and indicators on maternal health services don't vary a great deal from month to month. And when you configure a chart like this, such as may appear on a WHO standard dashboard, you typically find lines that are almost straight and almost horizontal when you are presenting the trends in immunization services or in maternal health services. But occasionally when you configure a chart like this, you'll find an indicator which shows an embarrassing jump in the value for one or several months, such as these values for antenatal care first visits. These are classic outliers. The challenge with using a month-to-month -month trend chart in order to identify outliers is that when the chart is viewed at national level, it is only going to reveal the very largest of extreme outliers. And the chart might provide a false sense of security that there are no outlier values for some of these other indicators, such as in pentathird doses. And in fact, if we had a more sensitive tool, we'd be able to identify extreme outliers even in these other indicators. Many of you are familiar with the excellent job done by the WHO data quality tool in rapidly screening the data sets and identifying all of the outlier values. In this case, for pentathird doses, we found all of the district level extreme outliers in the data sets and we can even use the tool then to drill down and identify the specific health facility 
which is responsible for the extreme outlier. Now, that's great. The use of the data quality, WHO data quality tool is to be encouraged and promoted and people should make greater and routine use of it. But we also need ways of bringing evidence of these suspicious values to the user so that they don't have to log into a separate application in order to see numbers that just don't look right. So another solution is to decentralize the process of data quality review to the level of the individual district. And when at district level, people view the same month to month trend chart that chart is much more sensitive for picking up the suspicious numbers. In this case, we've filtered the standard dashboard so that it is showing results only for one specific district. And of course, when the district logs into the DHIS2, this is the version of the chart that they will see. And Again, the chart is showing the values of a couple of maternal health and immunization indicators, but it shows that at level of District A2, we actually see that there's this quite suspicious rise in the number of reported third doses of Penta vaccine. So the chart can pick up outliers that have a magnitude of on the order of a thousand or two when it is viewed at the level of the district. And it's good to configure this type of chart to look not only at the values over the previous 12 months, but you can extend it backwards in order to pick up historic outliers from previous years. This type of chart can be used not only for maternal health and immunization indicators, but you, you can also use it to pick up outlier values and such things as the number of clients currently on antiretroviral therapy, or you could even use it to pick up outlier values in the number of diagnoses of diseases which you don't expect to be seasonal, such as the number of diagnoses of notifications of tuberculosis that are recorded quarterly. When we see this outlier at district level, one of the things that we immediately want to know is where did it come from? Which health facility? And is there a way to identify that health facility? Well, we could if we wanted to use the WHO data quality tool, but that would require leaving our dashboard. So that brings us to the second tip, and that is, that it is possible to configure a pivot table like this, which summarizes in a single pivot table, the values of all of the extreme outliers in this district for multiple data elements or indicators. And the pivot table is actually identifying the specific health facility and the specific month when the outlier was reported. In this case, the pivot table has been configured with a legend that highlights in red extreme outliers that have a value greater than a thousand. Now, you should be asking yourself, where do these outlier values come from? Do they come from the WHO data quality tool? Well, no, they have been generated by what is called a predictor rule. And predictor rules are amongst the applications that are found in the maintenance app. In this case, predictor rules have been configured to identify a couple of different types of Penta 3 outliers. How does a predictor rule work? Well, it uses a generator expression, which you see here, to evaluate the data on the number of Penta 3rd doses given and determine whether the value of that indicator exceeds a certain threshold. And if it does, then the value is exported to the new data element that has been configured for this predictor rule, the Penta 3 outliers. And it is this data element which is used to configure this pivot table. 
Before closing, let me touch on the challenges of identifying suspicious values of indicators which show a seasonal trend, such as the number of reported malaria cases. This year-on-year -year chart shows that each year there is great variation from month to month in the values of malaria. And this makes it exceedingly difficult to use even the WHO data quality tool to identify suspicious numbers. You can't tell whether the number is because of a possible error or it's due to a seasonal increase. However, there are workarounds and this chart shows an example of one such workaround, which looks at the percentage of malaria cases that are due to children under five. And it identifies months when the age distribution of malaria cases is quite abnormal, such as this value of less than 1% of malaria cases for this facility in February of 2020. So with Workarounds such as this, it is also possible to look for anomalies and therefore suspicious values in seasonal data. Thank you. Okay, so that's the end of Bob's presentation. I realized that he went quite technical very quickly. And I want to let you know that if you have questions about the predictors or the standard uh, identifying standard deviations or, or outliers with predictors and being able to put those onto dashboards, Please don't hesitate to put that question in the chat. We have guidance documentation specifically on this, and I will definitely forward that to you and also talk with you, work through the process with you. It's something that we definitely want to promote amongst the community. It's a, it can be a very powerful tool. So now I'm going to give us another glimpse at a, a seldomly utilized but very powerful functionality of DHIS2 specifically for data quality, and that's validation rule notifications. So one of the things to point out quickly here is that really most of what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, most of all of our jobs revolves around our email in some way. I typically like to ask that, you know, everyone here is a DHIS2 expert, a DHIS2 user. How often did you check your DHIS2 dashboards? Have you checked them today? Have you checked them this week? You know, um, oftentimes you find that even DHIS, DHIS2 administrators in countries rarely check their dashboards. But how often do you check your email? You're probably checking your email right now, some of you. Um, and the point to be made is we need to send the data to where people are actually spending their time. And especially send the alerts and data quality checks to where people are spending their time. And that's usually their email. I think we know through a lot of research that data trust generally is quite low. And because data trust is low, data use is fairly low. Um, and the way that we get around data trust issues is that we need to make sure that people have transparency to the data quality issues. The best way to make sure that people can see the data quality issues is for have DHIS2 detect them and send them to you in a place that we know that you're paying attention to, usually your email. Uh, it can also be, DHIS2 can also be considered, uh, excuse me, configured to send alerts and notifications to email and now even WhatsApp, which actually Brom um, Pilot showed um, that, that um, PSI has um, configured. So one thing to be very specific about though is that these alerts and notifications need to be useful, right? It doesn't need to just be, hey, there's a bunch of problems. They need to actually tell the user what they should do about the problem. And that's where we bring in standard operating procedures. Andrew in the last presentation about Rwanda touched on how thoroughly developed their standard operating procedures are in Rwanda and how well they're adhered to. That's a great model for any other country. We wanna make sure that you have really clearly defined standard operating procedures, and then you're sending the information to people that aligns with their standard operating procedures so they can actually respond to the issues that DHIS2 is detecting. They know exactly what to do because it's defined for them in their standard operating procedures. Um, really quickly here on just an overview of the validation rules. Essentially validation rules, if you're unfamiliar, are predefined logic or, um, between different data elements in, the, in, in a reporting form, essentially. So you can say very common one would be the number of um, uh, tests, or sorry, the number of treated should not be greater than the number of tests, right? Um, and if it is, there's probably a data quality issue in either the number of tests or the number of treated. 
they don't necessarily fully assess whether the report is accurate or complete. It just basically is a, uh, like I said, a, a predefined rule or logic um, defining the relationship between two different data items or data elements. And what we can actually do is we can schedule these validation rules to run routinely. So they can run whenever you, however frequently you want, daily, nightly, weekly, monthly. Um, and uh, then they can push notifications when they detect something. So when they detect that the number of treated is higher than the number of tested, it can send an alert. And this alert we can define specifically in the validation rule notifications. Um, this is a, a, another functionality in the, in the maintenance app, or excuse me, it's actually in the data quality app. Um, and here you can have custom um, subjects, messages, templates for each one of the validation notifications. Now, here's an example of one of the actual alerts that was sent out. So I, gener I um, configured a simple validation rule to run for any natal care visits. And I said that any natal care, um, the count of any natal care visits number two should not be greater than ANC one. Typically we find that ANC two is less than ANC one. Um, and what happened? I ran this against our demo database and just two validation rules when I ran it for the entire country for a whole year. I checked all the data reported in the entire country for the whole year and it produced about 2000 alerts. Okay. And these 2000 alerts were sent to me in 19 emails. Now I, ask the question, is that actually useful? If you're a national um, ANC program manager and you receive 19 emails full of 2000 alerts, is that useful? Well, no, it's absolutely not useful. It's just gonna be noise. You're just going to delete all of those emails. There's no way you can respond to that. So what we have to do is we have to make sure that we send the alerts, uh, make them specific and useful enough um, and a manageable amount. So here's actually an example from Rwanda where they have configured um, very nicely some key validation notifications and alerts to be sent out. Um, here, they're using these validation notifications to send out an email whenever there is a outlier for Penta 3 detected. Now, I wanna make sure that people appreciate that in national databases, data quality issues are not a bug, they are a feature. There will be data quality issues. We just have to make sure that we have the tools, such as these kind of notifications, that allow us to address them. It's no problem that Rwanda has outliers. It's very normal. Every country has outliers. But Rwanda has been very proactive in setting up these notifications that get sent to um, um, administrators' emails Again, a manageable amount. This administrator is only receiving 23 uh, notifications in this email. This is something that they can be very responsive to. Here's another example from Cameroon. Uh, I won't translate it, but the Cameroon is um, using their uh, validation notifications for actually disease surveillance, so outbreak detection. Um, and here they're actually saying if there's any cases of a certain disease to, uh, reported, then it should trigger a validation uh, notification and an email should be sent. Um, and so that's another way of using it. So it's kind of outside the, the, the realm of data quality and thinking a little bit more creatively about how to use this, this same functionality. Okay, so with that, I've ended my presentation. I am now gonna hand it over to Angela from Nigeria. So I will stop sharing. And Angela, please go ahead and start sharing your presentation and take it away. Angela, you're still muted. All right, thank you so much, um, Scott. Um, so my name is Angela, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Angela Abba, I work with Affinet Nigeria, and I'm going to be making this presentation on behalf of other co-authors. 
So my presentation basically is um, using innovative approaches um, to improve routine immunization data, completeness and accuracy on the DHIS2 platform in Nigeria between 2019 and 2020. So this will be the outline for the presentation, um, introductions, um, methods, results, um, conclusions, acknowledgements, and references. So by way of introduction, um, of course, we know how it's important that um, quality data is needed for planning and of, of course for resource um, allocation generally in the health system and particularly also for routine immunization. So Nigeria has been using DHIS2 um, as the only electronic platform for reporting um, our health data um, since 2013. Um, however, the routine immunization module was introduced in Nigeria in November 2014. And um, currently all states in Nigeria have that uh, module and are reporting their routine immunization data on the DHIS2. Um, over time, um, reporting has been stable, reporting has been excellent. However, we did notice through depth reviews that there were issues with data quality and then there were also inconsistencies in the quality of data that um, was actually reported. And so there was need to actually put in more effort to see how completeness and accuracy of the data that is being reported on the system um, achieve um, the desired um, level that it is required. And so this, um, this presentation basically um, describes one of the ongoing efforts within Nigeria to actually um, improve the, the reporting, the quality of data that is being reported for routine immunization in Nigeria. So what was our method? Basically, the, the major method which we used um, in, in implementation was the GIGS framework. GIGS actually is growing expertise in e-health knowledge and skills. It's actually a US-based fellowship um, that allows for transfer, for transfer of capacity between a mentor and a mentee. In the case of Nigeria, we actually had um, the mentor from Affinet, and then we had a government officer from the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency um, as the mentee. So we had to transfer capacity in terms of how to identify data quality gaps and address those gaps um, between Affinet, who is a partner, and of course the government of Nigeria and a staff from MPCB. So these were basically um, some of the strategies that we used. We started by identifying baseline. Um, we started by, first of all, we had to even decide what indicators we're going to be tracking in terms of um, data um, quality because it's quite broad. So we just restricted ourselves to look at completeness and accuracy. And under accuracy, we needed to define what indicators we would be looking at specifically for routine immunization. So we, we came up with our broad indicators. We had to document baseline and we documented baseline in February 2019 based on the data that was on the DHIS2. We documented for all 36 states in Nigeria, including the Federal Capital Authority. So over a period of months, monthly and weekly, we were monitoring those um, indicators and seeing how progress was made. Um, subsequently, um, monthly and weekly, we had to look at our indicators. Of course, we also developed a dashboard um, that was specific to the project and we had to design the dashboard with all the indicators that we intended to monitor. So the dashboard basically helped us to identify um, outliers during reporting periods and then we could send feedback to the state. So once reporting begins, we begin to monitor using the dashboard and then we're able to provide quick feedback to the state. Um, just like Scott had given in his presentation, we used WhatsApp platform, we used email addresses, we used SMS to send feedback to the state. We had Focal persons that were identified in each of these states and feedback was sent to them through these various channels. Again, after sending them feedbacks, which were quite also specific because we could drill down to health facilities to say which health facilities were having these data quality issues and provide that feedback, we had to also follow up with these officers to be sure that they had implemented their recommendations that were provided. Again, we also came up with a Google Sheet um, spreadsheet and Excel sheet such that the officers could also communicate with us and document that, okay, this is how far I had gone with recommendations of the actions that had been provided. And then finally, we also had capacity building sessions. Like I said, the entire um, framework was actually a form of mentorship to transfer capacity to the government officer. And so we had different capacity building sessions between the Affinet staff and the MPACDA staff. 
So these were some of our very quick results. Number one, this is like a snapshot of the dashboard that we created, um, the dashboard where we had to put in our project specific um, uh, indicators that we were tracking per month. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't show entirely all the um, indicators that we have on the dashboard, but this is just um, a snapshot which we check monthly and um, weekly as data reporting starts and we are able to quickly identify outliers and provide quick feedback to state. Again, um, this chart is showing us the completeness um, of the data set. So we're using just one data set as a proxy. In Nigeria, we have four data sets. Um, however, this chart is just showing us one of the data sets, which is um, basically the major data sets um, used for reporting in country. Um, like I said earlier, we had documented baseline in February 2019. And um, as of February 2019, which are the green bars, you could see where we were. And then by March 20, by March 2020, where the project had started, we did an average of reporting between March um, 19 and 2020. And we could see that um, there were a lot of um, improvements in reporting um, from the state. And notably, um, we had four states who were, who were quite the least reporting as of when we started. And um, a lot of um, focus was made on those particular states to bring them up to speed in terms of reporting. Again, um, we, we, we had data entry error proxies. So in Nigeria, HBV1 and 2 vaccines are not on our schedules. Um, hepatitis vaccine is actually given through the PENTA. So we were not expecting to see um, HBV1 and 2 administered on the DHIS2. We expect to see results for PENTA and not for HBV1 and 2. However, we did notice that um, some state and health facilities were actually imputing um, this data. And so we needed to start um, giving feedback to, to the state. So um, as a baseline, when we started, we started February, um, February, and then in March, we had started to provide feedback. We could see that there has been a decline in the reporting for HPV 1 and 2. However, we're not yet where we expect to be um, because we expect to see zeros, but we know that we'll get there over um, a period of time. Um, so this next result is showing us um, the vaccines and diarrhea. So this is BCG vaccines and diarrhea. BCG vaccine, as well as measles, is actually given to, alongside with the diarrhea. So we expect that if you open a vial of um, BCG vaccine, you should also open equivalent number of um, the diarrhea. So um, we did notice that there were discrepancies between these two. And that was also one of the indicators that we were monitoring. Of course, again, we're not where we expect to be because we expect that at this point, both lines should be touching each other. That is the standard and that's the expected. But we, we have noticed over a period of time that the gaps, um, the discrepancies between the vaccines and doses are gradually um, closing up. And of course, with regular and continuous support to the sub-national sub level, we would get to where we expect to be. So um, just to, um, to conclude, uh, we know that regular debt review, um, capacity building, tracking, and providing of feedback to officers at the, at the sub-national level can actually improve the quality of RI data as well as other um, health programs um, um, data. So uh, we need to just keep tracking and as much as possible provide feedback, detailed feedback and specific feedback um, to help um, officers at the sub-national level. Again, government engagement of government officers can also promote accountability and ownership of data and data quality actions. So even though these uh, interventions had, had stopped um, as at March 2020, but because we had um, involved officers from the government level, um, we are still continuing this process. And we know that the feedback, um, of course, is still continuous and being provided to the sub-national level. So for the indicators that are still tracked, we know that over time we will still um, get to the expected um, values or the expectation or the S standard for each of those um, indicators. Thank you very much. We did like to acknowledge these um, agencies, the MPS, MPCD, that's National Primary Health Care Development Agency, U.S. Center for Disease Control, Affinet, and the Nigerian Center for Disease Control. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Angela. That was really amazing to see how much progress has actually been made. And even though those lines aren't touching, they are getting really close. Uh, it's the first time I've ever seen something like that. So that was really cool. All right. So now we are handing it over to Tina from the WHO. So go ahead and start sharing your screen, Tina, and take it away. You're muted right now, Tina.
Should be good now. Yeah, go ahead. See my screen. So good day, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Tina Punyaman from the Data Evidence and Knowledge Management Unit of the Health Workforce uh, in WHO Geneva. So needless to say, we want to, we want to, I want to present to you in this session how, um, Scott, are you timing me or should I time myself? I am, but you can time yourself as well if you'd like. So I'd like to talk to you about this session, how WHO used DHIS to improve the health workforce data monitoring and availability. Uh, needless to say, uh, given what a, everything that's going on, the need for health workforce data is critical, and, and we've seen that. In the past, okay. yes, there's been a, a few global calls for strengthening a charge data, whereby in WHA resolutions, we've had, um, we've had we've urged member states to report on a core set of human resources for health data through the progressive implementation of the National Health Workforce Accounts, NHWA. You'll hear more of the NHWA throughout the presentation. Um, we see, we've had uh, resolutions following uh, with fiber action plans with strong focus again on NHWA and data and evidence, the SDG accounts for monitoring uh, health workforce density and distribution through the SDG 3C. Having said all that, what is NHWA? NHWA is a framework based on health labor market. So it's a health labor market framework. It's a system by which countries could progressively implement or improve the quality and availability of their health workforce data and the evidence. And hence, through uh, progressive monitoring on a set of indicators, which will then enable them to achieve their UHC or SDG targets. The framework itself covers a set of indicators on education, regulation, monitoring, migration, employment, information systems, and so forth. So what the NHW has helped us do, or the, the, the NHW implementation, is to move from very entropic, as many of you might imagine, um, health workforce data is in pockets. And sometimes the systems don't talk to each other, and the classifications are not harmonized. So to move from such a system into one where you have it all consolidated in a unified format with harmonized metadata indicators, thereby enabling a multi-stakeholder database to really provide evidence-based policy decisions. How did WHO get to do that? Uh, one of the aspects of NHW implementation was to provide an environment where the data could be harmonized, collected at the national level. What we did in WHO is to use DHIS2. So we have a DHIS2 instance in WHO, which we lovingly call WIDIP, which is the WHO Integrated Data Platform. We're in 230 now, soon moving to 234. We're excited about that. We have a couple of uh, users within WHO, but the health workforce data sets have about 400 accounts. We have data entry happening all year round. We don't make a close and open cycle, but we do our annual cut for uh, publication and release. How did we manage that? How did we say, okay, this has to be country at the center. Country at the center, meaning you have the country at the center doing the collection and the validation. That's when you have accountability. So we have a country focal point at the country uh, that enters data into this NHW data platform, which is the DHIS2. We at WHO also work with external partners whereby OECD or ICN or other UN entities and we share health workforce data. We enter them complementing the data entered by the, by the focal points. And we also work with ILO. So we collect the labor force service statistics. We also do a fair share of data mining and complement what the focal point has entered into. So all of this then goes into a process, a big machinery where we do a lot of data triangulation, validation. We use different tools to get to this. And that is where uh, we, we highlight some of our quality issues. And we do country consultations, validations. Eventually, the validated data is then used for reporting purposes, different analysis at the global level. One of the features that's really helped us in WHO is the data, the audit trail and the comment box. To have one place where it's transparent and you see who has entered when and the comments given explaining why this data uh, is falling down or dipping up has really helped because we have a system by which you have the ministries of health or the education who entered the data and then you have the colleagues at the country office, the regional office and the HQ. To have one place and not shared in emails, uh, have the centralized way of data versioning has really helped. Another, another feature we use quite a lot is the standard deviation outlier analysis, um, whereby we use it as a, a big net to catch the really outliers, the big ones, 
And then we take off and we have much more granular data uh, analysis and, and, and validation process that goes out, out of DHIS2. But mainly these two have helped us to improve the quality and uh, have more um, meaningful feedback to the countries and useful for country consultations. But what you can all imagine is having an excellent IT tool isn't enough. You really want accountability at the country level. And the NSW implementation has helped to improve the data accountability at the, at the country level by improving data governance. By having this one-stop shop for a country whereby you didn't, it didn't matter if your base um, education graduate data was somewhere else, but if you could put in the core set of education into one system, and then you had the core set from the payroll, all of them being in the NHW data platform, which is our DHIS2 instance, improve data governance, improve to see the data quality issues. And, it, and our NHW, I will not get into the details about this implementation guide, but the process itself uh, helped countries to take them step by step in the process by improving their data quality, improving the data flow. As you can imagine, uh, in many countries, um, the flow is not always the same. You have different, you have the civil service, you have the Ministry of Education, the finance, and within the HRX system, you have several pipes flowing either way. So understanding your data flow and then having to harmonize them and put them into a platform has really helped enable us to, to promote the decisions and policy level um, actions that has made an impact in the country to uh, a few of those encouraging ones that I'd like to share with you here is uh, countries have gone into this roadmap by which they say, oh, we're going to implement NHWA and thereby we're going to improve our data on selected indicators, be it on education, be it on migration, be it on health um, occupation hazards, whatever it may be. We have a few country examples where this has created enough evidence to promote, uh, to pass a bill to recruit more health workers and which has really created a difference in the economy. You, have, you see more interest uh, with stakeholders coming together to see, okay, my data is actually being used for evidence and I need to improve the data, improve the quality. Needless to say, at the government, at the regional level, of course, you have this uh, new possibility of being able to compare countries because you have one set of harmonized data, harmonized classifications, which then enable the cross-country comparisons and to see what's happening in a region at the regional level. All of that accounts up to the global level where we have increased data quality, increased comprehensiveness of data, most updated data, and um, of course it enables us at the, at, the, at, the, at the global level to provide the global community with a much needed update on what's happening with health workforce. We recently launched early this year the State of the World Nursing Report, which, is, which goes into much depth on what's actually happening and the policy levers that actually regulate or what are the different uh, policy aspects that are related to the nursing workforce personnel. Nursing, as you can see, are pivotal to health service delivery. They, they comprise um, more than 50% in some countries uh, of the national health workforce. All of that, and before I end, I just want to, I have to uh, speak through the, our new NHWA data portal, again, released very early this year. This is a fancy data portal, which I'm very proud of, and our, our team is really proud of to showcase, is it's pulling off this data that we have now, this wealth of information that we have in the DHIS2 instance of the WHO. Uh, we pull it out and we have um, country profiles, we have occupation profiles, you can, you can do your demographics of the country, within country, and now enabling you to do custom data queries. And, and it's, it's, really, it's really come to that, uh, that over the years, improving the data quality, as, as Scott just said, it's never a one-off. It's, it's, it's never just seen as a hiccup, but it's seen to be as a venue whereby you can improve your data, you can improve the comprehensiveness and understanding of the data. And this is one of the examples. And with that, I conclude. Uh, I think I, you owe me two more minutes, but I conclude. So if there's anything that I need to clarify, I'll be happy to. You can always reach us at uh, HR Statistics at who.in. Thank you. That was excellent, Tina. Thank you so much. It's also really incredible to see how much you are using the data audit trail and the comments in the aggregate data entry. That is a profoundly underutilized functionality, very, very powerful, and it's, it's due for a, a facelift. It's, it's time to do a bit of a revamp and improve that functionality, I think. And so I'm going to come back to you and um, get, your, yeah, get your thoughts and maybe we can get something on the roadmap for 
development. Excellent. Cool. All right. So, Joseph, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Wonderful. Thanks. All right. So go ahead, start sharing your screen and the floor is yours. All right. Can you see my screen? Yeah, sure can. All right. Thank you. Well, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Fanon Joseph, uh, resident advisor in Madagascar. I'm working for GSI. Uh, I'm going to present you the abstract on the effect of DHISO implementation approach to improving their quality analysis and use in Madagascar. Uh, this abstract was written by myself in collaboration with my colleagues uh, Musali Joelson from GSI and from uh, Mamiswa uh, Rasulu from the Ministry of Health in Madagascar. Well, um, the the, the topics I'm gonna get you through are objective of the session and the Madagascar health profile, uh, a little background on the, on the study and the DHISO implementation process, uh, as well as the, some um, RHI strengthening outcomes, and finally a conclusion. Uh, well, at the end of this presentation, we expect that uh, participants will be uh, will learn about how to use or how the use of digital health technology resulted in the improvement of their quality and use, as well as Madagascar's success stories and lesson learned in the implementation process of DHIS2. Well, needless to say that high quality data is key uh, is key for. Uh, uh, really um, implement, um, 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 follow to monitor progress uh, uh, of program. But uh, the health country of Madagascar is built on the, uh, um, like as uh, you can see here, the Madagascar is the fourth biggest island in the world. Uh, we have a population of 27.2 million uh, and 22 regions and 114 districts. There are around 4,000 health facilities, including, including private and public sector, uh, and around uh, 18,000 community sites. So the Ministry of Health in 2016, uh, in collaboration with uh, Measure Evaluation, which is a USAID supported project, conducted a baseline assessment of the RHIS using uh, the PRISM assessment in Madagascar. The main result uh, of this assessment were when I pointed out the poor data quality and sufficient uh, data reporting because at that time there was a, an access database using to uh, um, RHIS data management. Uh, that lead to limited access to health data by stakeholder. Uh, there was a creation um, of parallel system because they cannot access data so that they have to put in place a parallel system to get the needed data. And we, uh, put, uh, the result pointed out as well, the lack of coordination among stakeholders in terms of uh, um, HMIS uh, activities. So based on this result, the Ministry of Health decided to confirm every, uh, all the stakeholders involved in uh, the health sector in Madagascar to uh, um, um, develop a, an RHIS roadmap as well as a uh, RHIS stra uh, strategic plan. One of the main activity of this um, uh, RHIS strategic plan was to move from the standalone database to a web-based system, which was uh, DHIS2. So in uh, during this year, uh, the Ministry of Health, uh, in collaboration with its partners, start the rollout of DHIS2 by putting in place uh, a DHIS2, a national DHIS2 team, which was very important in the process because they, 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 they are the ones who will uh, uh, build the system and, and so on. So in 2018, 
the Ministry of Health, as you can see in, in the picture in my screen, uh, launched DHIS2 as the national platform to be used uh, for, to, for integrated uh, data in Madagascar. So from then, um, they uh, organized, they, will, they uh, have a pilot test, they proceed to a pilot test of DHIS2 in two regions and 14 districts. And three, uh, six months later, they, they uh, roll out the HIS2 to the whole, whole 114 district. And from 2019 to now, the, the Ministry of Health um, monitored the use of the HIS2, and we can see some improvement in terms of data quality. So as you can see in the, in the map here, uh, the rollout of the HIS2 were possible uh, by the contribution of the USAID funded project, like measure evaluation, my Miraca, access, impact, and so on, and global phone and World Bank. Uh, as the result of this shift to the um, web-based system, we can see a uh, uh, slight improvement in terms of data quality. Uh, if we consider the two main indicators uh, to measure this uh, data quality, like completeness, timeliness, and data accuracy. So uh, by using the, in 2016, uh, the, the standalone database uh, access was used. We had a, a completeness rate of 36%. And from the, uh, with the use of the HIS2, it's go up on, uh, at 91%, uh, as well as timeliness and data accuracy. And we can see uh, there that uh, Ministry of Health is conducted data quality visit uh, regularly. Uh, to monitor the use of DHIS2 and improving data quality. Uh, in terms of lesson learned in this process, we can uh, highlight the fact that uh, in Madagascar, they use an inclusive participatory approach in the implementation of DHIS2 that allow to, to ownership of the system and engagement of MOH. As I, uh, as I explained earlier, MOH, the, the national Madagascar team is the one who is uh, leading the implementation of DHIS2 in Madagascar. So uh, every, obviously they have uh, assistance from the University of Oslo by participating in the uh, academy uh, with the uh, DHIS2 community and support from the HIPS uh, and so on. But uh, what is very important is the fact that they are able to manage their system and uh, um, in Madagascar. So um, the use, uh, needless to say that the use of DHIS2 in increase timely stakeholder access to data. So as I explained uh, before, uh, uh, by using the access database to get access to data, the uh, stakeholder needs need to go to the department in charge of H uh, HMIS at the Ministry of Health and request data. And after some days, they send data through email. So now with the use of DHIS2, they can access uh, data uh, from the, the office and data is being used by the Ministry of Health and stakeholder in the planning process. Uh, for example, there is a dev the development of the health sector uh, strategic plan, the five-year health sector strategic plan in Madagascar. So DHIS2 was one of the data source in terms of uh, uh, HMI strategy. So um, the use uh, of the HIS2, as you all know uh, as well, uh, facilitate the integ integration and interoperability between systems. So now the, the country is moving to the integration of all the parallel systems like immunization, LMIS, and uh, uh, TB. Uh, so what I can say, the, uh, we can, uh, the approach undertaken in the use of the HIS2 provide implementation models to help country to move toward to uh, the journey to self-reliance. So all of that were possible with the contribution of all the partners. Obviously, we, are, we face some challenges, uh, like all of the low middle country, like internet connection, uh, um, turnover staff, heavy procurement for equipment and material at the site level, but still, uh, the country is moving to roll out DHIS2 uh, at community level, at uh, facility level, and community level in the coming years.
So it's what I would like to share with you. If there is an equation, I'll be there to answer in the DHS2 community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joseph. It's really, it, it makes those of us who actually developed DHIS2 give us a lot of pride to see how much it has helped and how well it's been implemented in, in Madagascar. It's a really compelling story, definitely. So thank you for sharing. Um, with that, we are out of time for this session. Please, again, uh, direct your questions to the community of practice. We'll be there to answer as much as we possibly can. And with that, thank you for your attendance and I'll hand it back over to Max uh, to get everything lined up for the next session.